Tracy, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so thrilled, Heather. Thank you so much for inviting me into your space. I'm excited for today's conversation. I feel like I've been, I'm not stalking you on the internet by any means, but you're in my algorithm. I see you all over the place and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. I feel like our work overlaps, but at the same time, we're, we're saying things differently and you talk a lot about things that I don't talk about. So I'm excited to dive in. And and I think the feeling is mutual, Heather, in the sense of stalking each other and seeing each other in the algorithm. And and also, too, I think the piece there that we really do our work intersects is whether we're talking about relationships, parenting, really at our core is how do we live aligned in a way that's going to feel good for us? How do we make choices that lead us down a path that doesn't necessarily mean life is easy, but means that we're doing things that are meaningful to us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the key is this, you know, the space of personal development. I think there's like a myth or an illusion that, you know, I'm going to read this book, I'm going to listen to the podcast, and then magically, my life is going to be easy. And Mm. I find that on the other side of it, actually, when you're running towards how you want to feel, whether it's relationships or not, it's not about ease, but it does get emotionally uncomfortable. Yeah. So I would like to dive into relationships. Um, I know, I mean, life is about relationships, but specifically the partner relationship. And I know you talk a lot about that, especially like post baby or like after parenting, you know, after the dynamic shifts a little bit. And I hear from a lot of women, um, kind of, you know, that the disconnect that they experience or, and I'm just curious in the work that you do, what you really see going on, um, with women and relationships and partnerships in general as Mm. a culture. I was speaking with my husband actually about, um, a session I had with a woman and I was talking to really kind of highlighting what is it about being a woman that when you give birth, what happens? And, I think there is this really powerful and scary shift into ourselves that a relationship can really change if we aren't prepared for it. So here's what I tend to see happen is that we prepare the labor plan. We prepare the nursery. We talk about who's going to visit when, what are we doing for feeding? We prepare all those things, but we don't prepare a relationship. We don't prepare what roles we want to sink into. We don't talk about who is going to do the night feeding. How are we going to signal to each other when we are crumbling at our core and just can't rock our child for one more moment in the middle of the night? How do we do that as partnerships? And so then what often happens is you throw in the hormones, the sleep deprivation, not having our core basic needs met, and we don't know how them to come together as a partnership. We don't know how to signal for help. We don't know how to say, hey, this isn't working for me. And wow, you're doing this and I'm doing that. And this isn't really feeling good. So how can we do this differently? So in the conversation with my husband, I had said, you know, it's so interesting because I think partnerships can start to go onto autopilot before having a child. And then having a child is often this big awakening for a mother where she then starts to, most people, not all, but I, especially I know your listeners are doing this work. We then start to go into this reparenting journey. We then start to question what shows up for us and how we're doing things and how we want things to be different. And so we go on this journey of change that sometimes our partners are not there with us. And that I see this transformation of a woman who perhaps maybe didn't have as much power or freedom or didn't ask for her needs. And then suddenly she's waking up saying, I have needs. They're not being met here. And now I have all of this resentment in my relationship. Yeah, resentment. Can you talk about that from like an emotional intelligence perspective? Because I'm all about like behavior is a language. So Mm -hmm. I think oftentimes we get in certain situations in our relationships. And then we're just like, okay, I just want to run away from this. This is not going to work. And then fear kicks in. So what is the actual, what is resentment? Mm. Resentment is a complex emotion. It's also a secondary emotion because it's made up of all kinds of other things. So I use the analogy of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is resentment, anger, maybe frustration. And underneath all of that are other things that are happening inside of us. 
Envy. Envy is a great one that shows up underneath resentment. Sadness, anxiety, worry, loss, jealousy. Um, Anger can show up in there as well. And oftentimes what is leading to those emotions is one of two things. One, I'm not expressing what it is that I need. I don't tell the other person what I need. Or I think maybe I am, but also I know that what we do in relationships is we do all these complex ways of communicating our needs and we're not actually communicating them clearly. That's one piece. Or the other piece is we're communicating it, but we're not getting our needs met. And I think that's an interesting road for us to go down because in a relationship, we can sometimes get stuck in this piece where we think our partner should meet every single one of our needs. Mm -hmm. And for many times, it's not possible. So if you're turning to your partner and saying, I need you to be the romantic person to do all these lovely things. And and maybe it's about asking yourself, is that the person who you chose? Or are you asking them to be different? And therefore, then we have to look at what are your needs really about in there? Okay. So I heard you talk about communication. Like, first of all, you have to be aware of like, I am resentful. I am experiencing resentment. And then- yes the awareness to communicate that, but there is an expectation there usually of like, this is what I need. And we expect the other person to then solve that problem, kind of still giving away our power instead of saying, I'm resentful. This is what I need. And this is what I'm going to do about it. Like that's Mm. a lot of new skills that most of us were not taught. Like our parents definitely didn't showcase that. No. And, and that, if we can even break it down, I talk about the steps of differentiation in my book and I, I show it how it looks in therapy with couples as well. And what it is, is first starting at self-awareness. What is happening inside of me? What doesn't feel good? And that then reflection and connection with yourself, which is, okay, I can take a deep breath. I can get myself regulated, but then we have to find that space of being able to communicate what that is. And communication, we all know how to communicate, but under times of stress, we're not good communicators. And often because of the models that we've had, we're going to repeat those patterns of communication. So, you know, I often ask my clients, who did you see? If if a client is particularly defensive, I'll say, you know, help me understand who was defensive in your life. Who did you see be defensive? And who was defensive to you in your relationships and who was defensive with each other? So if your parents... And starting to understand that that is something that you've learned growing up in your relationship. So, of course, that becomes your roadmap for how you then communicate with your partner. We can talk about defensiveness, criticism, stonewalling, right? The four horsemen of the apocalypse that the Gottmans have outlined and have been so important in terms of us understanding our relationships. So, I find sometimes like this self-awareness can be incredibly overwhelming because then we're like, oh, wow, I can see it all. Right. And then sometimes right. it gets bigger before it, like before we get aligned mm-hmm. and there's like a moment in there where we're asking, I see a lot of people and myself included, I've had many seasons and periods of this in my own relationship, which is like, is this going to work? And I asked you before I hit record, like when we're experiencing that disconnect, but we desire connection and we're becoming who we want to be, we're, you know, relearning, reparenting all the things. Sometimes we feel like we're disconnecting from our partner and then that like triggers fear. And what Uh if like the unknown of the future? So like, how do you answer that question when someone's like, should I stay? Should I go? Is this going to work? What do you say there? Yeah, I I think there are, I mean, the answer to that is always, it depends. And people in my office, this is a common spot we get to. I work with many women where their partners have not wanted to come to couples therapy. It was also the basis of Be Connected, my program, because so many women kept showing up saying, I want something different in my relationship, but my partner isn't willing to do anything. And that doesn't mean that you don't do anything. So here, here are maybe three possible roads that we go down. One is you do start talking to your partner and you get them on board. And if they're willing, many are, but we don't go once and say, you need to change. So let's go to couples therapy. That does not feel like an open invitation to do something different. Um, But when we can say, we're stuck, we're struggling here and we are experiencing this disconnection. And, you know, 
I really want us to have something different. And so then that person's on board with you. You can explore any kind of resource that might be helpful, or you start getting really intentional, the things that you're doing together. For example, when we start to feel that disconnection, we tend to go in with more words. We want to approach things from the logical, our prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that's like, okay, let's be rational, let's problem solve, let's fix. But what couples are also really good at doing is spiraling into our negative communication patterns where it's like one person blames, the other person gets defensive. And then I I say, I blame you because you're so defensive. And the other person says, I get so defensive because you're so angry with me. And so I often encourage couples to tap into some more of the doing and more of the connection. So what is it that sparked before when you first met? Did you greet each other at the door? Can you sit down at the table and share one emotion about your day so that you're starting to bridge these connections that feel good and you start to feel safe? And of course, Heather, and I know this is the work that you do with people, is we have to get out of our fear, get out of our own way and do that with the other person even if it might mean they don't have the response you're looking for, or they're, they say no, or they don't want to. So the one path is, are we on board together? The second path is you go and you do the work. You do the work for yourself because you are the one that can ask yourself at the end of the day, did I make choices today that were aligned with who I am and what's important to me? And the hardest piece in there is that you accept where your partner is. You accept them for who they are. You maybe even have to do a bit of grief work in there and acknowledging that they aren't the person that you wanted them to be, but then you get to do the work for yourself and that can ease that tension. And one of the most powerful things when it comes to resentment and disconnection is asking yourself, what do I want and need to be different? Maybe I don't want to be in the kitchen for 30 minutes after the kids go to bed, cleaning everything. Maybe I want to choose to just sit down on the couch. And wow, that's uncomfortable because then the kitchen's not clean the way I know it, right? All of those things. And then of course, then that last piece is if it's something that you are not willing to accept, your partner is not doing the work with you, then we do sometimes, we consider programs to do it on our own. We consider more self-help resources, therapy on our own, or we do decide to end the relationship. Yeah, that's a really hard an emotionally uncomfortable reality to face sometimes. And I can see when I know myself, there's been many. So my husband and I have been together for what feels like forever, 17 ish years. And we've had, I was a mother when we met and then we had two additional children and Oh wow. The version of me now compared to who I was then controlling. Um, I also remember when, as I was growing, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the fear that I was experiencing of like, if he doesn't, if I keep growing and he's not going to come with me. Right. So I would get more and more controlling of like, you need to do this. You need to do this. Um, and it was interesting. I have, because my boys are getting older, I'm starting to have more and more conversations with men of like, how do you want to be approached? And it's funny because you cannot put that control energy on them. They're like, they will shrink up and they're like, you tell me to do this. I'm going to do the complete opposite. Um, And so we're talking a lot about communication. And so how do we, like, do you have some phrases or scripts when you're really in like that heated emotion and you're like, I know I need to communicate in a connected, loving way, but just some like one-offs that are your go-tos when people are like, I don't even know how to begin this conversation. Every time I open my mouth, I met with defensiveness. Mm. I just want to pop back to that threat of power. And it speaks to what we're trying to build in in, in our relationships, which, which is interdependence. And interdependence is really hard to build in our relationships because we're holding both autonomy and intimacy. Like those are two hard things to have. And we know this phenomenon across all humans is that when we feel our autonomy is threatened, we will go and do the opposite. It's called psychological reactance. It's why advice giving in therapy is often not the most effective approach, right? We kind of go outside and around and help people, right? As coaches, as therapists, we help people come to the 
answers that they need. Because when we go in and say, you just need to do this. And if someone feels their autonomy threatened, they well, no, I'm going to push away at you. So I, I love that you brought that up there. And I think it's so important in our relationship for people to remember that the opposite of codependency is hyper independence. And that's also not what we want. We want to find a way to co-create our worlds. So let's go to those heated moments that you're asking. Those heated moments really require us to listen to our body. I know you also talk about the body and how important it is that we listen to our body. And you can start to ask yourself, what does my body do in those moments when things are so stressful, when things are so difficult, when I'm about to blow? And you can then start listening to that and finding ways to do something different. Because if you are, if your nervous system is already a 10 out of 10, you are in that fight or flight mode, you can for certain know that you're going to approach them in a really sharp way. And it's not going to feel good for either of you. So learning to push your feet into the ground, learning to maybe go splash cold water on your face before you say something hard, learning to do some progressive muscular relaxation, which is, you know, squeezing a body part really tight and then releasing it, noticing the difference between tension and releasing. It might even be some tapping on your arms up and down. Those are really good things first before we even in enter into communication. So some, one of the most simplest ways to come down to how we communicate with our partners is a fact plus feeling. A fact is something you both can agree on. You were late today. You said you, were, you would be home at five and it is seven. That's a fact. Then attach it to how you're feeling. I feel anxious not knowing when you're coming home or I feel upset or I feel whatever that is, right? Or what, what might be another one? Um, a fact of you had said, so you agreed to take the task of doing the laundry. And now it's been two weeks and you haven't done the laundry. And I'm feeling uncertain about how we're moving forward with something that we need to do in the household. Yeah, it's so simple, right? It, well, it's simple, but it's not. It's a skill. It takes, you got to put in the reps. You got to like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And then of course our uncertainty comes into it because we're learning new ways of communicating while they're still, they're learning new skills too. This brings oh, me yes. to the topic of uh, questions that I get a lot, which is um, mothering our partners. Mm. <laughs> Over mothering please, our please, partners please. or mothering our partners. They're not yeah. other children. Can we get into this? Mm -hmm. <sighs> we, nobody wants to be mothered. It, it is, it is such a killer to our intimacy and to our desire and arousal. If I have to tell you over and over again to do the thing, and I love using Eve Rotsky's word here. She's the writer of Fair Play, the best-selling book, Fair Play. And it's a great system to tackle the mental load. And so she describes, she, she labels it as the minimum standard of care. If the minimum standard of care is that, oh, let's take an example, you know, oh, it would be a good minimum standard of care. We put the dishes away in some fashion at the end of the day. But if every night I have to say to you, you have to put your dishes away, that erodes at your relationship. Uh, and many partners will come to me saying, and this is interesting, Heather, because many people do feel comfortable coming to therapy when sex is no longer taking place. And that's because for many men, they feel comfortable saying, well, we're not having sex, so let's fix this problem. But when I, when I peel back the layers, actually, there's been a breakdown in the emotional connection over years, and now sex is no longer happening. Yeah. And so sex is the symptom. It's not the problem. And the problem is, how are we emotionally connecting? And emotional connection requires vulnerability on both parts. It requires two adult minds coming together, sharing their inside world and practicing listening and being curious and supporting each other, not one partner having to step into the mother role. So I think there's always this dynamic. This is where the dynamic piece is so important when I do the couple's work. And I'm moving, for people listening, I'm moving my hands back and forth like an infinity loop because what is so easy to do is we can listen along to these kinds of episodes. We can 
read the books and join the programs. We can even go to our own therapy and get our own coach. And then what we do so well, well, if my partner changed, they're the problem. If they did something different, but we have to step back and ask ourselves, well, hang on, you know, what am I doing in this dynamic? that is leading us to feel so stuck here. And so if every time, let's just take an example, if something isn't done to the way I want it to be done, am I going to go to my partner and say, you didn't do it my way. This has to be done this way. That is kind of entering into this mothering role. Or if you're going in emotionally and saying, tell me how you feel, what's happening. You have to do this. Again, we're entering into more of that mothering position. And so then for us, it's about stepping back a little bit more. And often too, the dynamic that shows up here is that over-functioner, under-functioner dynamic. One partner over-functions, that's entering into the mother role. I'll do the grocery list. I'll do all the um, items from the pharmacy. I'll make sure you always have deodorant and toothpaste instead of pulling back a little bit and letting your partner take up just as much space as you do. I have, I can very much resonate with this and it I think raising three boys has also blown my mind because there is the biology of the male brain, female brain, and how they do function differently. And then of course, gender roles. Um, And I deep societal and cultural expectations for our boys too. Oh my goodness. And to be honest, I, I don't know. I just saw like a little reel about this, about how I think it was actually Mel Robbins. She was interviewing her husband And she was talking about, he was talking about like, yeah, six years ago, I started doing men's retreats. And she's like, well, what are the men talking about? She's like, I give them a list of like, what do you want? And the page is blank because they're like, I don't know. I'm here to serve my family. And she's like, that's what women do. And he's like, yeah, I know. But we abandon ourselves too. And I'm like, this is not just a mothering issue. Like, self-abandonment because we love and we want to support other people shows up differently for everyone. And I've noticed in myself, as my boys get older, how this shows up differently in my husband than it does myself. But watching me go, like stepping more into like a, a coach role of like, okay, this is coming up. How can I support you? And being okay with their emotional discomfort, Mm -hmm. that like changing that dynamic, like you're saying of stepping back has been fascinating to watch, which within myself, because then I have to feel my own feelings. Then I have to like literally change the current inner relationship and how my children expect me to show up for them. I've taught them that, I'm going to fix things for you rather than my mom isn't going to do that for me, but she'll definitely like support me as I'm learning and growing. So that in itself has been a huge learning curve in my own life. And um, yeah, it's uncomfortable to change the current in relationships. It is so uncomfortable. And we have to be willing to sit through that discomfort and trust that we do, in most cases, have the skills to ride the wave of the emotion. Here's that piece that this comes into is around in-law families. And so because you as partner, as female, as mother, you are doing all of this reparenting work and your aha moments are all around you. And then you look at your partner and you're like, oh, look at that dynamic with your mother. Look at that dynamic with your father. And your partner might not be there and might not be ready for that. And so you go and you have the family gathering and then you leave and you say to your partner, you say to your husband, wow, did you see your mother do this? Why did she do that? And so you're in that role of like trying to pull them to something. And what happens in those moments? They get defensive. They shut down. They are not ready with you. But if we were to enter in those conversations, so that's where that dynamic comes into play. Um, And in-laws could be a whole other topic. But in the sense of when we are in partnership, we can easily point out all of these things and tell them what they need to do and how they should show up differently. But I like to encourage people that instead of coming top down and being the the hero in a way. We want to be the guide or we want to plant seeds. If I go, I like to stick with tree analogies. We want to plant seeds. And we plant seeds with our partner by, again, stepping into that over-functioning role and telling them how they should do things. And we start asking questions and getting more curious. And those questions would be like, 
How did it feel when your mother did that today? Oh, did you notice this? What happened for you in that moment? What were you thinking? And so then you're stepping out of the mothering, all-knowing role. Oh, man. I, there's so many things we could talk about. And I'm taking us down different roads. <laughs> I know. No, I love it. I want to go, I want to like full circle, go back to intimacy because like you were talking about how, you know, in couples therapy, the, the man would may bring up uh, sex and say like, this is the symptom. This is what's going on. And that's what brought them there. And maybe for the woman, it's more like emotional connection or whatever brings her to the table. And so now that we have awareness, you know, we're talking about communication. We're like, okay, okay. I get all of this. How do we then, because when you were talking that last piece, I just, I was thinking, wow, that's a lot of softening required, right? Like within myself to soften, to re-enter, take radical responsibility for my words, my behavior. Where does intimacy (laughs) come into play with that? Because now I'm overwhelmed with all of my stuff that I'm unlearning and now I have to re-enter to connect and create intimacy. Mm -hmm. So once we have the awareness, maybe two people are on board of like, maybe not at their, you know, at their own pace, might have like a tortoise and a hare when it comes to self-awareness, but okay. Yeah. We're aware we want to work on this. So now how do we re-enter and create intimacy and connection? Mm -hmm. Let's broaden your definition of intimacy. And because I know many couples are are focused on sex. Mm -hmm. And of course that is what our society teaches us to focus on the end goal. Did you orgasm? Did you not? Let's make sure we're having orgasms. And while they are nice and they do produce oxytocin, which is the cuddle hormone, and it's allowing you to feel more bonded, at the same time, we lose then the ability to play, the ability to find pleasure, um, and to have fun. So if we broaden the definition of intimacy, then we're looking at things like physical intimacy, of course, sexual intimacy, emotional intimacy, which is sharing our inner vulnerability and our inner experiences. But there's also experiential intimacy, which is the doing of things together. Are you as a couple trying something new, learning a new board game, going for the walk, uh, making a meal together? Are you having experiences together and stepping out of the everyday mundane of, hey, you got the splash pants for kids, who's making lunch, who's doing drop off, wash, rinse, repeat? That's a sure way to lose our desire and connection, spiritual intimacy, and then spiritual value-based intimacy, and then also intellectual intimacy. Are you sharing ideas? Do you listen to podcasts together? Do you read books together? Those kinds of things, talking about interesting topics. Um, So when we go back to rebuilding intimacy, let's broaden that definition and focus on the relationship as a whole. I really appreciate that you're bringing this up because my husband and I talk about this all the time because there's always cultural through lines, right? Like, of course, it's like work harder. Okay, now do nothing and work less. Like we have such (laughs) extremes and, you know, I've been in this industry long enough where I'm just like, I'm just putting a blocker up there because I see how people get confused. And I'm like, is that your thought or are you grabbing onto somebody else's thought, right? Mm. Like, how do you define intimacy? But, you know, this goes way beyond orgasms. And when we're just talking about that, is that aligned with your definition? And like you said, there's so many different aspects of that. And as you were kind of defining that, what I was thinking is capacity, right? Like, I talk a lot about capacity. How do you want to feel in your everyday? You can't just run through your to-do list and run Mm -hmm. from work to school to this to that or one thing to another from sunrise to sunset. And then when you create that pocket of time on the weekend and you're like, okay, it's you and me, you're going to want to take a nap. You're not going to want to have fun. There's nothing left to have fun. Exactly. It's not about time. Intimacy feels like a feeling. Hmm. It, it is the um, ability to see the other person throughout the day, to hold them in your mind and then the, to put that into action. Mm-hmm. So for people who are both working from home, when I talk about greetings and partings, they say, well, we're both working from home. And my reply is great. When you cross each other in the hallway, 
squeeze each other's arm, do something playful. Mm -hmm. One person pop into the other person's office and just, you know, give them the pat on the back or the squeeze something that again, intersects your day and instead of, and I love that you've said that Heather, instead of waiting for all to happen at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that also then brings in the question around anticipation, which building desire, we need anticipation. And sadly, what happens to anticipation is we lose it as time and marriage happens in relationships. Yeah. Time, marriage, and kids. Yeah. My, um, my husband and I work together. So we're together like 24 seven and we work from home. And so we're together all the time. And I have noticed even just like a walk with no cell phones or, you know, if you're sitting on the porch or something and just dreaming together and it's usually me leading, like this is what I'm thinking. And he's over there being like, I'm checked out. Like my brain is not on. And I'm like, come on with your dreams. But I have had to accept that I'm the visionary. That's me. And he is not that. And well, he is, but in his own way. And so Mm -hmm. sometimes I'm leading those conversations, but it is, you know, it's like repetition. It's not a one-off. Um, and this is why I think women are so powerful. And I'm curious your, your perspective around this. Like we have the ability to manage a lot. And I feel like the shadow of that can be burnout or Mm -hmm. overwhelm or exhaustion, but like, what are the superpowers of women? Oh my goodness. So when we are aligned, when we are aligned, when we are aligned, Mm. So my husband and I work together too, and he joined my business. So it's our business in 2021, 2021. But even before that, we opened a clinic together. We opened our, our mental health clinic, integrated wellness here in Ottawa. And I, p- part of that Heather for my own journey was I had to release a lot of control. And when I do that, we're a better team. So that's one piece. That's not the, su- the superpower, but I do think there's something in there where we need to tune into how much control are we trying to take? Um, and there's something else I want to reflect back to you there, which is that you accepting that you're the visionary, that when you have that time together where you're out for the walk or you're sitting, looking at the scenery, that you're going to accept that this is who you are instead of saying, why can't he do this? Why doesn't he tap into this? I wish he would do more of that. And that I think acceptance is really important in in front of us, acknowledging that you are two different people. A woman's superpower, I think, is her sense of intuition in terms of tuning into what feels good, maybe what feels right, Um, And being able to use that to guide forward. And I think, gosh, I would love to think more about this, but I'm I'm not going to get it all. It's going to, this is one of those questions that will stay with me for a few weeks. You'll be Um, like sending me an email. I'm totally going to be sending you an email. I got it. It's one of those things that just keeps you thinking like, wow, we actually have superpowers. We've been impressed for so long. I don't think it's necessarily that we multitask because truthfully, when I multitask, I burn out and that's not great. And and our partnership dynamic that has been really helpful is when my husband says, you know what, clear that day, you need to look after yourself. And so that's really powerful. So it's not multitasking, although I know many women are like, I'm a better multitasker. The research actually shows that women and men are the same in terms of multitasking. Um, but there's something about the ability to go forward and to take some of those risks. I'm not saying that men don't take risks, but there's just something in there. Mm -hmm. And I think that does come from this fierceness that shows up after becoming a mother. Yeah. And just reflecting back on what you said, the acceptance, because I wasn't always that person of like accepting who I am. Um, And it is, it's like meeting people where they're at and and not trying to change people or control them and being like, you are you. And I need to fall in love with that version, not the fairy tale that's in my mind. Um, And I have noticed in myself that when I started to accept accept my husband for who he was and myself, actually, it's probably more when it was self-acceptance. Then I started to accept everyone else as who they were you know, we're all on our journey. We're all in the middle of something. And I noticed that 
really impacted my parenting too, accepting my children for who they were and not mm-hmm. trying to change them, accepting my mother for who she is and not trying to change her, just meeting everybody where they're at. So Tracy, to wrap it up, what do you have coming up in 2024? What are you doing? Where can people get more of you? Um, all the things. All the things, the best thing to do. I love this part of podcasting because I don't know who's listening and I love receiving DMs on Instagram. So come and send me a DM. Dr. Tracy D is my handle. Let me know what stood out for you from today and maybe even a small action forward that you plan to take from today's episode. And I have lots of free resources on my website, one of which is 100 questions to deepen your connection. And I love this resource. My husband and I took it on a date night. We got through one or two questions. So we tested the questions and it came out of hearing from so many women saying, okay, our children are a little bit older. I'm looking over at my partner and I don't like, what do we even talk about? And so this is about building emotional intimacy between two people. So that's on my website, drtracyd.com. Um, you can go forward slash connect in there. And then also my book is called, I didn't sign up for this. And I tell you four real life stories of couples in my office who are breaking patterns and finding joy in their relationship. And I also open up the window to my own marriage and the deep resentment that I found myself stuck in. Mm. You are a gift. Thank you, Tracy, for just being you and your, I just want to see your commitment to this because being on the other, not the other side, but being (laughs) in a similar field. Wow. Some days you're just like, I'm like, why do I care so much? And Mm -hmm. so I just want to say thank you because you were changing lives and making a huge impact and helping people break those generational patterns. So thank you for your commitment to this emotionally uncomfortable work. Thank you so much, Heather. And thank you to everyone who joined us today.